Let us now continue with the wish fulfilling treasury. We've already talked about the formation of the animated and inanimated world. And we've covered on the uh, formation of the Kalpa, and we're going to talk about the duration of the Kalpa and then later degradation and empty Kalpa. Out of the 20 medium kalpas, we've already covered that we are in the ninth medium kalpa. I think we've already covered that. In the medium kalpas, there are lots of the concepts and knowledge about living. Currently, we are studying that through the Buddhist approach. Uh, perspective, Buddhist point of view. In these classes, we're not really covering the pith instructions of Vajrayana. We're rather talking about the general knowledge of living in a worldly life in this world through a Buddhist perspective. And to expound that is quite necessary because many think that, well, Buddhism only talks about the uh, transmundane and Buddhism only talks about those metaphysical aspects but doesn't talk about the worldly. But that is not true. If you were to truly delve into the teachings of Buddhism, you would be able to find the vast knowledge that would also cover on the world the aspect. It is similar to that whenever you look at the worldly teachings, you have to study things stage by stage. Uh, so when you truly delve into the Buddhism teachings, you would be able to find all kinds of knowledge over there. That is why uh, the Wish Fulfilling Treasury is considered as the, the encyclopedia of Buddhism. Today we will talk about the six types of livelihood, the six guards, seven arrogance, seven prides, four conventional expressions, as well as various grounds of the conventional expressions. Long Chenpa over here talks about the six types of livelihood, which is also talked about in the Chinese version of Yogacara Bumi Shastra, except the tra translation is a bit different. The six types, including agriculture, business, farming, um, and industrial sectors, as well as literature and uh, math related. Other than that, there's also craftsmanship. I think the explanations given in Buddhism is rather quite well, it is categorized really well. In terms of our current world that we live in, tourism, which is part of business, is one of the uh, main sectors that people would live in, uh, that would uh, have their livelihood. But right now, since we have the pandemic, it seems that agriculture and farming is considered one of the most stable as well as most important. Look at, at the other countries such as Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and lots of the island countries because they completely rely on, or majority of their uh, income would rely on tourism. Therefore, after the pandemic, since there is the interruption with the international commute, then those countries can hardly keep their livelihood anymore. So business-centered economy is risky, but agriculture and the farming-centered economy is rather safer. Other than that, there's the agriculture sector as well as the literature and the um, math-centered or math-related um, works. Also, there's the art and the craftsmanship. I think craftsmanship, we can think of them as the schools or colleges that trains students or trains 
um, people in various kinds of trades, practical skills. In the future, I think the Buddhists on one hand should build the Buddhism centers and monasteries to propagate the Dharma and to bring benefits to sentient beings. On the other, I think we can also focus on training people in various kinds of skills and techniques and training people to help them to create their livelihood, such as in agriculture and in business. That is another way of benefiting sentient beings as well. Currently, there's lots of talk about making the rural areas more prosperous. Therefore, uh, there are lots of infrastructures built, such as libraries and uh, academy for um, technical trainings, as well as senior homes and uh, schools for training the blinds. Uh, also, there are lots of gyms and massage centers, spas that's built over there. So, in our secular life, I think these kinds of buildings and these kinds of ways of uh, giving teachings to the others through these kinds of secular ways would be easier. Otherwise, as we know, it is harder to build a monastery and it probably will be more and more difficult to build monasteries and give people teachings through uh, the Dharma, the, the proper Dharma teachings and the empowerments. For a period of time, I think it is not going to be that easy. But we can use a more secular way to propagate Dharma and to benefit others, you can build a small hotel. On the one hand, you could have enough uh, money to run this hotel. On the other, you could use this money to help the others, uh, to help them to create their livelihood. I think as a Buddhist, we need to consider about the good livelihood for the others to provide such opportunities. Also, there are the six types of guards, such as groups of elephant and herds of uh, horses, as well as uh, uh, chariots and armies and wealth and relatives. I think this kind of protection that's described are mainly based in the ancient times because nowadays we don't have groups of elephants that would fight in the war or even horses. Even in Tibet, we don't have that many uh, herds of horses anymore. So for people with high stature, uh, they would uh, be protected by herds of horses and uh, uh, by their wealth and uh, relatives. Recently, because of the assassination of Shinzo Abe, Shinzo Abe he, though, had 17 guards around him and all professional guards. But that didn't help to prevent um, the shooting. The person who assassinated him per pretend to take photos and uh, wrap the gun and pretended it to be uh, an umbrella or something that to take a photo. So sometimes, even if we were to have lots of guards, even if we were to be protected in this seamless uh, iron box, even if we have infinite numbers of guards, it's difficult for us to protect our life at the time of, uh, uh, the, at the time of death. Of course, it's important to try to protect your life, especially people with high stature. Sometimes it can be successful, those guards can be successful, and sometimes it just happens that uh, they don't succeed in protecting you. And then Longchenpa talks about the seven sufferings, the birth, death, the illness, and death, also the suffering of being with the ones, uh, the, the resented ones, and the suffering parting from the loved ones, the suffering of not getting what ones want, as well as the suffering from the five aggregates. But the, the, the suffering of the five aggregates didn't really talk about over here. We have all kinds of sufferings, and we are quite aware of the sufferings of birth, death, uh, old age, and illness. Also, the kind of sufferings that we have to get together with the ones that we resent, and the, we have to part with the ones that we love, and we, the suffering that we get from not getting what we want. 
Sometimes you really want to get uh, fame and uh, wealth and benefits, but you, want, you just can't get it. And that's one of the sufferings. Sometimes we talk about the eight kinds of suffering. Sometimes uh, over here in Lung Chenpa's teaching, he talks about the seven types of sufferings. It is not that because I'm a Buddhist, therefore I'm trying to praise Buddhism. But when we think about all these kinds of sufferings, we can definitely categorize our sufferings into the, the Buddhism, uh, following the Buddhism teachings or following the categories of Buddhism. We would be able to recognize our suffering under the framework of suffering that's described in Buddhism. We talk about the Four Truths, and we talk about the Twelve Nidanas. If you don't study those teachings, of course, you, you, can't, um, you can't apply them. But after, uh, after learning them, indeed, you'll be able to see how precisely that Buddhism has analyzed all the different categories that far surpass the Western philosophy or far surpass the the now science, including biology and so on and so forth. Now the next one, we're going to talk about the seven kinds of arrogance. The first one is arrogance, it's a contemptuousness. That is, whenever we face people who are lower than us, thinking that I am better, I'm better than the others. Maybe sometimes you're just not, you do not surpass that of the others, but in terms of body and speech and your action, you would demonstrate such kind of contemptuousness. And then the second one is arrogance of self, which is self-grasping, which is ego. It is when people, and the next one is the excessive arrogance uh, for people who naturally do not have all kinds of merit, such as uh, miraculous powers and so on, and uh, for people who have not attained enlightenment but consider themselves having miraculous powers and uh, have already attained enlightenment, this is excessive ar arrogance. The next one is of aloofness. This is taking pride in posing to be modest, thinking that I'm so humble, I'm so modest, I'm so low-key, and all of my methods are the best, and others are not. In this way, you're taking this moral high ground and treating the others in such a way um, and pretending to be modest. The next one is taking arrogance in the wrong. Such as when people praised um, greed as love, as genuine love. Or some non-Buddhist schools would consider that killing the sentient beings are courageous, are activities of a hero. So these are considered as taking uh, arrogance or having arrogance in the wrong. According to, to some non-Buddhist schools, uh, they claim that being incinerated by the five fires is the most supreme. Therefore, they would jump into the fire. <coughs> and thinking that particular spirit is being extremely brave and should be praised. So that is also considered part of taking er, uh, having arrogance in the wrong. Now the seven pride, according to the sutra, he says that we really shouldn't have any of the pride. It is just as if we are made of wood, we are simply uh, mannequins. We're puppets that's made of wood, and we only rely on the different, on the various kinds of parts, but thinking that we should take pride in it. The sentient beings of desire realm are no other than tools 
being um, are no other the tools under the influence of karma and affliction. We're simply a tool. We're simply um, such kind of a, a puppet. Therefore, there's nothing for us to take pride in. Then, so let's look at the different types of pride. There's the pride in disposition, in looks, in youth, in health, and in wealth, as well as in violence and in the uh, learnedness. This is easy to understand. In terms of arrogance that we talked about earlier, the arrogance are displayed in the body and speech, but, er uh, but pride resides within. It is in one's mind. So if one were to be very proud of oneself, uh, they would not speak it in the language or display it through the body. Rather, it is a sense of pride resides within, thinking that, oh, I have the disposition of a king. My father is a great uh, authority, a, good, a really um, highly powered um, authority, or I look really good, and I'm really beautiful, or thinking that I'm really young and I'm very healthy, thinking that I have lots of money, thinking that I'm so learned. Over here in the Lungchenpa's teaching, there is another one is called uh, in violence. It is thinking that I could harm the others, I could abuse the others, and um, by har harming the others, that is to be taken pride in. For example, if one were to enter the military or uh, to take part in the police force, we would to say the, the mundane people would praise them a lot and thinking that oh, they're so courageous, especially when a person were to kill an enemy, uh, people would praise them to say that's a sign of a heroism. But the Tibetans, for example, uh, they, would, they would have lots of scars from fighting. But if you were to have a scar at the back, it means it doesn't really show that's a sign of a hero. But if you have a scar at your forehead, then that means you have a face-to-face -face, uh, confront, uh, uh, confronted uh, conflict. Then that may be a sign of heroism. Uh, in terms of learned pride, taking pride in learning, uh, if you were to say that I learned the five treatises and so on and so forth, that is also taking pride. Now, the next one is the four types of conventional expression. The four types of conventional expression are listed as listening and contemplation and distinguishing uh, expressions as well as direct experience and wisdom. Whenever we listen to some teachings given by the others, for example, teachers and our parents, that is a listening and contemplation ex a conventional expression. And if we after our own contemplation and our own observation from our own wisdom, which is more creative than that is the distinguishing uh, conventional expression. And if you were to directly see a particular um, understanding or directly perceive that teaching and then give it to the others, without hearing it from, from the others. That is the wisdom conventional expression or through your personal direct experience or through the um, pointing out instructions from the guru to see the nature of your own mind. That is a direct, that is the direct from the direct perception. Those are the four types of a conventional experience, uh, conventional expressions. Also, there are the foundations of them, which can be innumerable and difficult to, to finish expounding them. But in general, there are a few types. So for example, that's based on the sentient being's capacity, on their grasping, on their provision, on technology, including, I think, in our society, since there are constant changes, therefore the conventional expressions are constantly changing as well. Sometimes we need to create a new convention. Sometimes uh, we need 
need to continuously to change our convention as well in terms of the ethnic um, conventional expressions. Sometimes the names and the different terms that's used would be um, modified, especially the larger the larger ethnics uh, would pervade and the smaller ethnic uh, conventional expressions would slowly disappear. Therefore, at the times of propagating the Dharma, it is quite important to recognize, it is quite important to come to a common understanding of the conventional expressions. That is why we are trying to uh, work on this dictionary. There are some new terms and some old terms, and we need to give the appropriate terms to uh, when there's new things or uh, new things that's produced because of the changes. Otherwise, later on, you won't be able to understand it. Sometimes when we give certain names, some of the names or terms are given based on auspiciousness or not, and sometimes it's based on one's imagination or dualistic thoughts, and there could be not much of the explanation. There are a variety of the conventional expressions. And there are the ones that has meaning and the ones that doesn't have meaning. And there are lots of new things that need new conventional expressions uh, in various fields, such as in the technology or in the nature, in animals, in plants. Those are all very much needed. Whenever we look at those expressions, it's important for us to see it to notice it and to analyze it, especially when you encounter a new word, you need to understand the usage of it and uh, uh, the nature of it, what, what word is it, or when to use it, or when it appeared in the dictionary. That is why it's quite important to know a bit about the uh, lexicography. After studying the foundation of the verbal expressions or the conventional expressions, I think um, you can further analyze those terms by yourself. The next verse says that knowing the six things and uh, the nine things, there are the eight things related to retinues. So let's talk about the, what are the six things. That is the aggregates, datus, ayatanas, and uh, uh, the place of uh, uh, dependent arising as well as the non-place of the dependent arising and the roots. The six consciousness, and the aggregates, when we study the um, Shrangama Sutra, we are well aware of the five aggregates by now. On top of that, we know the tattoos and the, the, um, six, the six tattoos, which is the earth, water, fire, wind, and emptiness, as well as consciousness. According to the uh, jewel garland of Madhyamika, it also talks about the 12 ayatanas and the 12 nidhanas. Uh, on top of that, there is the place and the non-place. The place means the uh, all of the dharma that is subject to um, the truth of suffering and the truth of accumulation of suffering, which should be eradicated. Also, the non uh, that is the non-place, and then the place refers to all the uh, the dharma that is subject to nirvana, uh, that is subject to the truth of cessation, truth of path. So that's the place and the non-place also. There's the roots, the form roots and formless roots. So the form roots including eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, 
And the formless roots are mainly divided through the consciousness, uh, which is based on the faith, the roots of faith, the roots of diligence, the roots of mindfulness, of um, uh, meditation, roots of wisdom. Those are the five roots, the five formless roots. On top of that, there's the roots of liberation according to Abhidharma. There are 22 types of roots described. That has the six roots on top of that. There's the roots of men and roots of uh, women, also the undefiled roots, uh, the roots of vir the virtuous roots, the roots of body, and the roots of uh, life. According to the Hinayana Abhidharma, uh, there are lots of descriptions of the secular roots and the noble one's roots. You should read more into the Abhidharma, the Mahayana Abhidharma, and the Hinayana Abhidharma. The teachings, though, are a bit, uh, the expressions are a bit different, but the meanings are mostly very similar. <coughs> Now let's look at the nine types of things where it talks about the forms and so on, the five aggregates as well as um, the provisional things and uh, that mainly points to the 12 ayatanas, also the things of production which is the 12 nirdanas and uh, the uh, things of abiding which talks about the livelihood of sentient beings. Previously we also talked about the four types of things. Uh, the first one is called the the deluded things, which is uh, the dharma that's subjected to the truth of suffering, the truth of uh, accumulation of uh, suffering. And uh, the pure things include the dharmas that's subjected to the truth of, uh, truth of cessation and the truth of path. Also, there's the, a variety of things which talks about the disposition and propensity of sentient beings. When we studied the Uttara Tantra Shastra, we talked quite a bit about the dispositions of uh, sentient beings. The teachings that we studied in the past, uh, such as uh, the ornament of the Sutra, on ornament of the uh, Sutra Shastra, as well as the Uttara Tantra Shastra, are quite important because it contains the profound teachings given in Buddhism, and uh, they were they explained those teachings very clearly. Over here, the the disposition and propensity of sentient beings can be described in various ways. For example, we have very different tendencies. Some of you like sweet, and some some like sour and spicy. Some like the, the color of white, and some like the color of blue. For monastics, of course, we can only wear the red colored robe. But that is because of the limitation of your current uh, profession, so to speak. Um, but we all have different habitual tendencies. We have those propensity of colors, uh, of different likings of colors. Also, from the aspect of disposition, we can say that the different minds of sentient beings is their disposition. All the things that exist on the outside is called disposition. Uh, when we look at rocks, the rocks have the disposition of wind, of water, of fire and uh, of uh, space, everything and uh, uh, every phenomena in this world from its nature, in fact, it could be very complex in its disposition. And in terms of the human beings, when we talk about the disposition, the roots of the sentient beings, we, uh, the, of the human beings, we can be also quite complex as well. Whenever we think about, oh, why is this person thinking so differently than us? Uh, and when we even look at the disposition of plants, they have different flavors and out of their different causes, out of the different uh, conditions, they have different uh, dispositions as well. Well, after studying with our Tantra Shastra and ornament of the Sutra Shastra, you would be able to understand lots of the teachings like, like such. It is not as the, all the things that exist in our world are not as simple as we would imagine them. So that is because of their disposition uh, with form and disposition without form, which are more based in the energy. Uh, 
on the ener on, on the energetic level, and some of those energies are not even that apparent. Uh, they're rather quite subtle, and those kinds of subtlety would become the disposition that would mature in the future. When we studied dispositionsy in with our tantra shastra, I really felt that it was very helpful for me to understand. Uh, when we look at a rock, if we were to analyze it further by the professionals, they would look at a rock and they would be able to understand that there are such and such elements and it can be used in different machines. Uh, or when the pharmace pharmaceutical pharmacist looking at a different medicines, they would be able to uh, diagnose which one is poisonous and which one is not. Even if we were to talk about the uh, disposition of the Tibetan paper, it is made of a, a typical a type of uh, grass, and uh, that paper is very expensive. It is made in Dugger area. Um, the Tibetans would make this particular type of grass by their wisdom uh, and experience. Not talking about the Tibetan paper, let's look at tissues. Do you have tissues? There are so many different layers in tissues. This one has only one layer. No, that's the same. You can take that back. I don't want to waste yours. this particular tissue paper has three or four layers. That's enough. You don't need to pass me so many tissue papers. I'm sitting on the throne, the Dharma throne. I don't need that many tissue papers. So we talk about the different types of dispositions with the tissue paper. Now the next one talks about the uh, things that's related to the fundamental teachers, such as the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, the Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas, and their their stories and, and various things that they uh, various their conducts. Now. The, uh, the next one talks about uh, the next one is the 37 factors of enlightenment and let's not get too extensive over here you should know that already and the uh, next one talks about the eight things related to the retinues and the retinues means that there are a large groups of uh, followers the yoga uh, yoga uh, bumi charya shastra talks about the eight types of uh, assemblies in the verse it also says the common um, expressions. The common expressions means that not only those different people in the cup of duration, but the various categories of beings, let it be kings, brahmins, the lay practitioners and merchants, uh, they have different kinds of expressions in their writings, in their shastras, in their texts that talks about various things with their different expressions, which can be a myriad of expressions. If we were to be very detailed about it, sometimes we can look at the historical books from Qing Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, uh, from the Spring and uh, Autumn Dynasty of War, and uh, from the Xia Dynasty and Shang Dynasty, and so on and so forth. Whenever we look at 
the various kinds of expressions that's related to uh, the shastras and texts. It is quite important for us to analyze as well. Of course, many people would think now that, well, since you uh, talk about how Buddhism is uh, so profound, why doesn't Buddhism talk about the computers? Why doesn't Buddhism talk about the software, the, uh, the USB sticks and uh, our hard drives and so on? Why doesn't Buddhism talk about them beforehand or to make predictions of them? But this is very much related to the different terms and expressions that we use. For example, all the terms that we use after 200 or 2,000 years, are those terms going to be still used? And when we look back the, at the scientists from hundreds and thousands of years ago, they do not particularly use the same term as we do now. Therefore, the expressions and the terms doesn't necessarily need to be expounded in the terms that we use now. Also, it is not quite necessary because that part of knowledge is not as important as the knowledge of liberation. The Buddha who is omniscient, he talks about the ways of getting liberated from samsara. So from this particular angle, though that the Buddha knows about the numbers of the ants and leaves in the world, but he expounds on the, teach, uh, expounds on the teaching to lead us to liberation. Since those kinds of numbers and expressions are not important, to lead us to the cessation of suffering. During the duration kalpa, there are so many different names, different categories, and different analysis, and different teachings that's included in a variety of shastras, such as Agama Sutra, Long Agama Sutra, the miscellaneous Agama Sutra, the Eko Agama Sutra. Those are expounded quite clearly, and each of those sutras place a different importance or expound those teachings from a different angle. The Buddha gives teachings in other related sutras and shastras as well, uh, sutras as well, uh, talks about in the kalpa of duration, there are a variety of expressions. In terms of the short period of time, Larangar developed from uh, nothing till now, and then later, after a few hundred years, if Larangar were to disappear or were to not exist from a sentient being's personal aspect, we can also see there is the formation, duration, and degradation and empty kalpa. So the human beings can use different kinds of expressions to express the related knowledge and the related understanding. Now let us stop here today.